and a co-organizer of that event. Um, and welcome to everyone. Uh, so this is a, an event about academic freedom, but um, it's not an academic event. Uh, we want it to be more about our uh, personal and political stances, and uh, we don't want, uh, we, we, we told our panelists we don't want academic papers, but rather their thoughts and reflections and their experience uh, to share with, with the audience and all participants. And so our idea is that throughout the day, um, during each panel, you might, uh, at the end of each panel, you might want to ask questions, but you also might want to keep them for the afternoon session in, in which we will break, uh, break out into groups and uh, try to reflect collectively on what academic freedom can mean. And uh, thinking about this, actually, um, yesterday we were having dinner with Uli, uh, Ulrike Flader, who is one of the panelists in the, in the panel on Turkey. And uh, she said um, something which I think is the question for me for the day. Uh, can we be uh, academics and political? Is it, is it possible to be both? And I think in that tension, uh, the notion of academic freedom is, is questioned, and this is what we are about today. So, uh, I'm going to invite the panelists for Turkey just now. Um, it's, it's the most crowded panel, so we're going to have to keep our presentations to 10 minutes so that everybody gets a, gets a chance to uh, that's a bit um, Everybody gets a chance to talk, and then we still have to take 25 minutes for questions from here and from uh, our our audience, our virtual audience. Tina. Come to the front. So, I'm going to introduce the panel. So, Tuna Kiyuku uh, from Bosphorus University is currently uh, having a fellowship in the University of Edinburgh. Um, Ulrike Flader, who is from the Demo Center for, uh, for Peace. Um, democracy. Yeah. Democracy. Um, then we'll have two uh, speakers uh, on Skype. Um, so, yeah. Tebesum Yilmaz uh, from the University of Tübingen and the University of uh, Istanbul. And Azat Zana Gundogan, who is now at Cornell University. And then we will have a commentary from uh, Carlos Freud, uh, who is from the University of Salford. So that's five people talking, and uh, then we'll open the floor to questions. Tuna. All right. Thank you very much for um, attending this very important event. Uh, when I arrived um, in Edinburgh uh, in May, uh, after a few weeks, I had the, uh, I had the uh, pleasure of meeting Sophia and Isabel, and when we were brainstorming about what's happening in Turkey and what we can do, this idea came up uh, to have this panel and to make it actually comparative, which really excited all of us, and I hope it's going to be a uh, really uh, productive day for all of us. So, um, as you probably know, because it became uh, very much discussed and very much publicized uh, around the world, in Turkey, more than 1,000 academics signed a peace petition titled We Won't Be or We Refuse to Be Part of This Crime that was uh, taking a very uh, clear and um, very definite stance against uh, the indiscriminate killing and violence that the Turkish state has been uh, waging on the Kurdish population at least uh, since uh, the June uh, 2015 elections in Turkey that the uh, governing AKP lost its uh, parliamentary majority. And then, uh, in reaction to this peace petition, the government decided to take uh, very much of a, a swift action, and more than 500 academics have been under disciplinary uh, investigation, more than 100 of them have been fired from their posts, both in public and private universities. Uh, many uh, have been forced to retire, and four uh, of, uh, uh, of the academics, uh, one from my own university, have been jailed and kept uh, in prison for uh, more than a month, for about 40 days, without any charges against them. So it was apparent that uh, the peace uh, petition signatories, us, 
uh, have really sort of <laughs> made this government, made the state very uncomfortable. But then when I was thinking about how I would open up this panel and um, give it to the other speakers, I decided to take a, a little bit of a longer uh, historical, historical uh, look at this, uh, at this issue of academic freedom and the state of uh, universities and intellectuals and academics in Turkey. And I decided to give you a very, very brief background uh, so that you know we can sort of contextualize what's happening right now and see it as part of a uh, clear pattern. Well, universities, academics and intellectuals have always been uh, on the foreground and on a, having a fragile relationship or fragile status in Turkey uh, ever since the formation of the, of the Republic and even before that actually uh, during the uh, 19th century in the Ottoman Empire. But when we look at the uh, Republic's history since 1923, we see that in every sort of uh, major uh, political disruption with coup d'etats and etc. For example, in 1960, 1971, and 1980, lots and lots, hundreds of academics have always been fired. You know, they're, if they are public employees, and for a very long time we only had public uh, universities in Turkey, their public employee status have been taken away from them. They're, sometimes their passports have been confiscated. They cannot leave the country. And in parentheses, I have to mention that one person uh, who uh, lost uh, his, uh, his post in Turkey, who was scheduled to or who was uh, going to Germany just yesterday, was uh, stopped by the police. His passport is taken away and he's under police custody. So, you know, this has been going on for a very long time. In addition to that, nine academics uh, in, uh, in recent history in Turkey have been assassinated clearly or directly for their political views. And you might, of course, uh, be not, not be surprised to learn that these are all left-leaning, uh, democratic, and uh, a lot of them are quite uh, directly involved with the, with the question of the, uh, the Kurdish issue in Turkey. Uh, for ex or uh, in other cases, many people, many academics have been jailed. For example, uh, very well-known case is Ismail Beşikçi, a Turkish uh, scholar, a Turkish sociologist, a very uh, well-known and a very accomplished and uh, impressive scholar uh, who is working on uh, the Kurdish issue uh, for things that he has written, has been sentenced for 17 years and spent 17 years of his life in jail. So this is a trend. And for example, I would just like to give you one more example and then talk a little bit more specifically about how the government controls universities nowadays. Uh, and this example is particularly uh, uh, telling and scary in my opinion. In 2000, uh, a decade, more than a decade ago, uh, there was a very curious incident in Turkey where the police forces uh, took to the streets thousands of police uh, officers took to the streets of Istanbul after two of their uh, members have been killed in street clashes in a Kurdish neighborhood in Istanbul. Uh, and the clashes took place because that Kurdish neighborhood was uh, under uh, very, very uh, violent police. Uh, Officers were killed. These thousands of police officers who were chanting on the streets and who were sort of demonstrating were shouting, uh, damn uh, human rights, you know, down with human rights and that sort of stuff. And when they were sort of passing the, the gates of Istanbul University, one of Turkey's uh, most uh, accomplished and uh, biggest universities that Tebessum is actually was giving a PhD from, when they were passing the doors of the Istanbul University, the gates of the Istanbul University, they all raised their guns high up in the sky, started sort of going like this, uh, sort of with their guns, and uh, said, this is where all the traitors are, uh, and that was a very clear signal and you know a lot of newspapers in Turkey were scandalized and were sort of really surprised about what they saw but you know if you were a left-leaning or sort of like a critical scholar or student in Turkey of course this was no big news because the police and uh, police forces or you know extra uh, legal or sometimes you know uh, 
paramilitary or uh, those kinds of uh, forces have always been present in universities, have always sort of uh, intimidated scholars and students, and have always, whenever there are big student events, and there are many in Turkey, whenever there are big uh, student uh, confrontations between fascists and uh, uh, democratic forces, the police always takes the side of the fascists and always protects them and always uh, shows uh, very clear violence against uh, the democratic uh, students and democratic forces in the university. So what I'm trying to say is that what we are witnessing right now is really not new, but it is on a much larger scale uh, and, uh, well, in a twisted kind of way, it's sort of thankfully because of its size and because of the horrible uh, state response, it woke the world up to this, to this, to this uh, unfortunate fact. So before I uh, turn it uh, to my uh, to the rest of the panelists, I just want to give you a very sort of brief uh, again overview about how the Turkish state, uh, not through violence this time or open violence, but through indirect violence, controls our universities. Uh, in uh, after the 1980 coup d'état, which uh, still pretty much shapes and is shaping the current uh, Turkish politics, because we are still governed by the constitution that was written by the coup d'état leaders. Uh, to many people's surprise, that is the case. The 1980 coup d'etat uh, led to the formation of the Higher Education Board, or uh, the, uh, the Turkish acronym is YÖK. And this is like a extraordinarily powerful and undemocratic and um, uh, yeah institution that is directly controlled by the central government in Ankara. And YÖK has total tutelage over our universities. The universities in Turkey have absolutely no administrative uh, independence. The rectors or the presidents of universities are appointed by, uh, by the president of the country and uh, the YÖK uh, gives uh, some names to the president and the president can appoint whoever uh, they want. For example, in my own university, Boğaziçi University, we recently had uh, uh, within the university our presidential election and uh, about 90% of uh, the current uh, academic staff voted for our current president, uh, Gülay Barbarasoğlu, a very impressive woman, and our president Recep Tayyip Erdogan is refusing to appoint her, uh, and most probably will appoint someone who got only 7% uh, of our votes. So this is all possible because of the YÖK, uh, creation of the YÖK, uh, this uh, uh, coup d'etat institution. There is no freedom of speech in universities, uh, whoever uh, says things against the governmental line can be put uh, under uh, investigation and, as we see, can be sort of fired very easily. The budgets of universities are controlled by the central administration. Promotions, for example, I applied for uh, being uh, promoted to uh, associate professorship last year and after I signed the peace petition, my uh, application was annulled. They cancelled my application because apparently I made one uh, small uh, uh, procedural error. Uh, so that's just one little, very little uh, incident and people are experiencing much, much larger and much, much, much more horrible stories. Um, so the curriculums of the universities are governed by YÖK and so on and so forth. Let me not, uh, let me not sort of uh, bore you with the details. So when this... Uh, two minutes, yeah, I, I'll be done. This is my, uh, this is my final sentences. When this... Uh, um, peace petition uh, issue came up and we all signed it and when we saw the state response we were not surprised uh, in any way that this was happening but we actually most of us were kind of surprised and taken aback with the with what kind of a reaction we generated from the government. I mean, it's just a peace petition. It's nothing really out of the extraordinary, out of the blue. I mean, this kind of thing happens all the time. But the content of this peace petition, the title of it that we will, we refuse to participate in this crime, really, uh, I think, uh, made the state of Turkey feel like uh, a rabbit in the flashlights of a, of a car. I mean, it just basically froze and sort of had to face itself in the mirror and then started attacking us. And I won't get, go into the details of the, what happened after the peace petition because the rest of the panelists will do it for you. So here I would just like to uh, hand it over to uh, Uli, who will talk about uh, or contextualize this peace petition in the, in the larger sort of uh, environment of the Turkish state's violence against Kurds. And then um, Azat uh, from uh, Skype will take over. Azat was a faculty member at uh, Mardin uh, Artuklu University and he got fired uh, from his post. 
uh, with no reason but uh, this political sort of his political stance and now he uh, is in Cornell as a visiting scholar and then Tebessum who was a PhD student uh, in, at Istanbul University uh, lost her uh, PhD student status and had to uh, start over from uh, master's uh, level uh, in Germany and um, all of these people's lives are uh, really disrupted. I'm at Boğaziçi University, one of the few universities in Turkey that uh, still protects its academic staff. Our president refused uh, to, uh, to start a disciplinary investigation against us and that's one of the reasons why the president Recep Tayyip Erdogan is refusing to appoint, reappoint her to her post. So my personal status is seems secure so far, much more secure than other people who have witnessed much worse uh, reactions. But I'm also kind of wondering what's going to happen to me. So, all right, and then uh, Carlos will uh, close the uh, close the panel with his commentary. So, Uli, yes, my thank microphone you. Too. Oh, you do I? Have, I think I have my own. Okay. Yes, um, I think I have a presentation. I was just wondering whether Let I have to do. I have to go that way. Or? Okay. Um, yes. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, and um, I think I'm I'm part of the um, Academics for Peace International Committee. I just so that you can sort of uh, know where I come from. I, I lived in Turkey for the past nine years and I was uh, just about to start a position at Nishantash University when the um, petition was signed. I in fact didn't sign the petition, probably with some kind of fear that I could be deported. Uh, but because my partner signed the petition, I was fired too, or my contract was, um, was revoked. So I, this is sort of just gives an idea of the uh, arbitrary and the and the and the spectrum really of of things that have happened. Tuna has already um, uh, hinted at, at some of uh, the things that had happened, and um, well, I'll talk a bit more about this uh, later. What I want to do is sort of un uh, try and give you a feeling why this petition sort of. Um, the context really of the petition and why this has to do with the title of the whole um, uh, event today, National Security Threats for uh, Academia. And I think that's what we also want to talk about because what happened was it precisely in this condition. Now, I've not used this before, so we'll see. Uh, this is a quick timeline. I won't go into the details just because uh, Tuna already said everything, but maybe you, you might remember that in, uh, on the uh, 7th of June last year, elections took place, which um, meant that the AKP actually lost its majority. And uh, let's say um, the Kurdish party or a coalition kind of party between the Kurdish party, which was initiated by the Kurdish party and some left-wing groups, won 15% uh, of the vote. And this is pretty much what we think triggered, it's a little bit too simple, but what triggered what we see, have seen since then is a new war strategy towards the Kurds, but also towards any kind of opposition in Turkey. And uh, what happened then was that this election was uh, cancelled and a new election was um, announced for, or a re-election was announced for, for the 1st of November. But in between there, we saw an um, immense um, or an extreme um, rise in violence, especially in the Kurdish region, but which started off with a massacre towards 34 um, uh, socialists, uh, uh, young people in the town of Suruj. And so from then onwards, the state uh, decided to um, declare curfews in uh, individual cities in the Kurdish region, and, um, and which led to um, very many deaths and a total militarization of, of the area there. Um, I'll just show you some pictures here. So these were pictures that we were then confronted uh, with uh, day by day until then sort of the situation arose that we uh, that the uh, petitioners decided to write this petition. So we had military in the streets in the whole of the Kurdish region. Uh, these curfews were 24 hour and um, at first they were declared in just a few towns, but then sort of uh, uh, n n um, for months on end, weeks on end, were not um, uh, stopped so that the um, 
the people actually, the whole population in these towns had to flee their, their situation. So what we, the, flee, flee the cities. And what we see in the petition is that the petition uh, directly criticized the state precisely for this. It said that there is a massacre going on and deportation. And this was something that the state obviously didn't want to hear because in their eyes, it's an, an operation uh, in a situation of national security. So, um, until uh, the uh, 10th of uh, October, uh, the 10th of January, sorry, in which the petition was signed, already 50 people had died. Um, uh, among them, girls like um, Helen Shen, who was uh, shot by the police. This girl, Jemile, her body, she was shot in her own yard, and, uh, in her own yard, sorry. And, um, and because of the curfew, the family couldn't, wasn't able to bury her and had to keep her in, in uh, cool her body in, in, in the house. Bodies were kept lying on the streets for days and days, which is also a form of, um, uh, uh, to show what, what, what is possible. What, you are not even allowed to mourn your death. You're not allowed to bury your death, uh, dead. So uh, in the case, these are all pictures that um, we were confronted with. And you can imagine that these, the, seeing these pictures, knowing what is going on there, sort of build up to the situation that the petition was written. And this is specifically the situation of uh, Tibetina. Also, people were killed who were trying to, um, um, to uh, attend to the death, dead or to those who uh, were, uh, were injured on the streets. Uh, for example, these four women who belonged to the Kurdish women's movement, they were on their way to, um, to um, engage to make, to, on the one hand to make a point and say no we're going to break up this, um, this situation we want to stop this and on the other hand attend to the wounded there but even they were killed. Also people who were on the streets trying to leave their homes with white flags as well were shot at. And this is this, uh, the, shows the, the extent of the destruction at the end, uh, at the, towards the end um, uh, of, these, um, of the curfew, which is something that we at that time at, uh, in January didn't even know. So when we were talking about uh, massacre and deportation, we had no idea that the war would actually finally end in the total destruction of the cities. This is Diyarbakir. Uh, um, this is the old uh, historic city center which has totally been flattened. And we see pictures like this from other uh, towns as well. Here, as uh, you can see how the state demonstrates its, its occupatory, literally, um, uh, and destruction of, the, of this town, which is Nusaybin in Mardin. So I mean, I think you can, uh, this is just to sort of understand the situation in which the academics then decided uh, that um, um, that there's nothing else to do. And uh, you have to imagine that um, the petition, a petition, as Tuna already says, is something very, very small if you are confronted with a war, kind of, a war strategy in a way. I, ha I don't think that any of the, uh, the signatories actually thought that they could topple the war strategy with a, with a petition. But you have to imagine that the situation was really, we felt strangled at the time. We felt as if we had n no other possibility to express our words, to express our critique towards these policies because beforehand, and sorry, this is another uh, slide, I'll come back to this, because beforehand, so many people had died. This was a ma the massacre I talked about in Suruj, and on the 10th of um, October, um, over 100 people were killed in a bombing in Ankara who were asking for peace. So what I'm trying to say is that all forms of democratic critique that are standard, in, uh, standard for a democracy that you uh, go to the take to the streets or in other ways were closed down. And all we had in our hands was literally the petition. And we had no idea that at the end of the curfews, all, over 300 civilians would have been killed. Eight, uh, 78 of them children, 60, uh, over, nearly 70, female, but um, also 30 that are over 60. So you can, this just gives you a picture that these are not people that were sort of um, 
um, opposing the state in that kind of way, and that, the, that there was a war going on against the population to which the academics then rose their voices. So what I try to say is that this, the situation was so unbearable that these uh, academics said that it was like a scream for air or a, a, a taking a gulp of air, no, saying, no, we will not be party to this. Um, yes. Um, what then obviously happened, and uh, I'll show you some, um, some pictures to that, was that, um, as Tuna already uh, mentioned, uh, Erdogan himself, the president of Turkey, um, criticized the uh, academics or started a smear campaign calling them traitors, which is obviously the easiest way, uh, then pseudo-academics, dark figures, um, uh, and a danger for the unity of the nation, and I think that's what we also want to talk about here. Um, uh, it, what you can imagine that then, this was nearly a, 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 start, a start shot for all kinds of uh, so, uh, forces in society to then take up their part of this smear campaign towards the academics. There were the, I don't know, Osmanlı or Jakler, so maybe um, a kind of militant organization or fraternity which belongs to the AKP. Um, they um, took it up in local and social media to um, individually pick out um, uh, some of the scholars, show them in the social media with their pictures. Again, just a few days ago, this has happened again, and sort of denounce them so that you can imagine that the, that the population there could take this up and possibly lynch our, um, our colleagues. So some of them actually had to flee the places that they were teaching and living in. Uh, on the other hand, the police for, uh, obviously um, um, took, took colleagues in, into custody. The state prosecutors issued search warrants to uh, confiscate computers, laptops, cameras, whatever you might need for your academic research as well. Uh, travel bans, we still have colleagues, even a German citizen uh, who has a, a travel ban and cannot uh, um, return to his country. Um, and on the other hand, the universities themselves started off these uh, um, uh, interrogations and, um, um, and started firing the, um, our colleagues from, from their positions. So um, just to sort of illustrate this, um, this is a two, I have uh, some, some abstracts from uh, two, um, AK, uh, two journals that, or newspapers that are close to the AKP. This is Yeni Shafak, and I'll have another picture from Yeni Akit, which just um, uh, illustrates the uh, dimension. Here, the academics are um, seen as the accomplices of the PKK and accused of terrorism. In this one here, you can see the nice connection between the intersection between sexism, um, um, racism, and nationalism here, sort of uh, accused of being um, abnormal in some kind of ways, en enemies to Islam and, uh, uh, and Turkishness. Here also, a few of our signatories were picked out and um, um, accused of being Ar Armenian lovers, which is also a very an interesting uh, connection in, in Turkish nationalism to uh, either Jewish or Armenian. It's, it's variable in a, in a kind of way. And uh, I like this one because they've gone into such a, a nice effort into uh, showing how, these, uh, how the academics were uh, connected to the barricades. Here showing the academics behind the barricades, literally saying that uh, the academics were part of, of terrorism, obviously. So yes, um, that's pretty much uh, just to illustrate um, uh, what kind of the dimension of the smear campaign. And I mean, this is funny for us in a way, but on the other hand, it, me it also means that these people are, um, are open to any kind of assault. And that's, I think, uh, that's why it's not, not just funny, is it, even if we laugh. So, um, so it's a serious danger. There's no guarantee that anything can happen, especially in small towns and cities, which is closer. People know where you live. It's a serious danger, and that's which our colleagues are confronted with. Obviously, I've already mentioned that a lot of people were um, suspended. I'm trying to shorten this because um, um, 
Tuna has already said something. Maybe one point is important. Those who were, um, were, um, were fired at the beginning, the way the state did it was to go via the most precariously employed at the time. So first of all, and this is the university that I was going to work at, the whole the sociology department, by the way, including the head of department, were fired um, um, uh, for signing the uh, petition because they were working on the most precarious working conditions. So we have a, an interesting connection here. In the private universities, they have contracts where it's, it's stated if you have any kind of, if you um, um, uh, express any kind of political attitude or something, you could be fired and so on. So, um, um, and it, as soon as it then turned to the public universities and it's sort of equaling out now, uh, um, uh, as well. Uh, it was also those on uh, term contracts, three-year three year contracts that were then not renewed. So the state has a strategy in the way how they're trying to rid the university of these critical voices. And I've already had the sign that I should shorten this, so um, I just want to make one more point. Um, the question is, why did the um, um, petition um, arouse such a critique. And I think this is already what Puntuna sort of said. There's a, there was a line, and especially also under the AKP government, already a tendency to rid the university and in place uh, scholars that are in line, in fact, in a party line. Uh, with the ideology that uh, the government um, represents at the moment. And, uh, and I think that we can see that this uh, petition was used in a way to do uh, precisely do this. And I th there's one more thing that I want to say, that I think that the um, petition had a very, was uncomfortable for the, for the government precisely because it did not do what the government wanted. There was, uh, even at that time, there was a kind of code of critique. And at that uh, point, you were allowed to criticize the government, but in a certain way. You also had to criticize the PKK, if we see. And, the, gov and the, the petition precisely didn't do that. It said, the government is our addressee. We, have to, we can't address the PKK, we want to address the, the government. This is not okay, what the government is doing here. And this was something that broke with the code that I say, the code of critique in that kind of sense. And that's why, for one, it made the petition very, uh, very powerful, but it also means that, uh, that what we see has followed, that, they were, uh, that the petitioners were uh, under, uh, understood as a threat to national security. Thank you. Azat, do you hear us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Great. All right. So shall I continue? Yes, please Azat. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello everyone. I greet you all from the US with uh, sentiments of solidarity. And uh, I would like to thank uh, organizers and uh, especially Tuna for inviting me to share my First, and experiences of oppression in Turkish uh, academia and uh, about my, my colleagues' attempts to reclaim uh, our university. Uh, I'm an early sociologist. Uh, I was one of the uh, thousands of honorable signatories who signed the call for peace uh, petition um, until June 2016 when I and my wife with our two-year-old daughter had to leave the country, uh, we both had to work at Mardin Artupi University, which is in the city of Mardin on the Syrian border uh, of Turkey. Currently, I am a Scholar Rescue Fund Fellow and a visiting research scholar at Cornell University, trying to find ways to settle down and move on with my life and uh, scholarship after being forced into exile. So, uh, in my discussion today, uh, I would like to share with you uh, 
uh, my ideas uh, about what's been happening uh, regarding the issue of peace petition and uh, attacks uh, against uh, academia in Turkey. So uh, I would like to accomplish two things. First, I aim to locate the recent state attacks against critical academics into the context of Kurdish political movement in Turkey and the region. And uh, this, would, this point would be a kind of partial answer to what Uli has just asked. Why did the petition arouse such a reaction in the part of the state? Uh, and secondly, I want to provide you with a personal account of a Kurdish academic who worked in a Kurdish city when uh, Turkish state's practice shift from peaceful reconciliation to security measure in its current policy. And uh, I'm sorry guys, I, I, I sound here my own voice, uh, which makes it hard for me to concentrate. Uh, would you please at least uh, at a mute your microphone? I'm sorry. Is it better? Okay. Yeah. Well, so you can hear me, right? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, uh, in December 2014, uh, my spouse, uh, who is a Middle East historian, and I left the US with our then five months old daughter to accept the job offers of the uh, Martin, Martin Article University. Uh, we had uh, two tenure track jobs in the US and good career prospects. But uh, as, as, as a Kurdish couple who has ideals for a uh, peaceful solution to the Kurdish issue in Turkey, we were thrilled by the opportunity to finally give back to our community. And uh, for decades, uh, this geography has been hit by uneven development and an unnamed civil war between the PKK and the Turkish state. And that's why it was exciting uh, to channel our expertise and experience we acquired in the U.S. to the development of students uh, there in Martin and the uh, region and be role models for our students who are the first college-educated members of local and underprivileged families. And Martin Artuk University itself was also a pull factor uh, for our decision to leave the university, uh, to leave the U.S. and uh, because Turkey's peace process with the PKK uh, had already begun in the first three months of 2013 after nearly four decades of uh, struggle in which an estimated 40,000 lives were lost. Um, negotiations with the PKK later began and as part of some reforms, public universities were founded in the Kurdish region. So Artuklu was founded in 2007 as a flagship university in the region and a government project with great resources. For instance, uh, it hosted the first Kurdish studies and Syriac studies departments in Turkey, which was a uh, kind of uh, revolution in itself in, in terms of Turkish academia's development. Um, the founding administration invited qualified scholars located in North American and Western European universities, as well as Kurdish studies scholars from Syria, Iran, Iraq, to apply for positions at the university. Many well-qualified scholars responded to this call and took up faculty positions at the university. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the escalation of conflict between the uh, Kurdish community and Islamist militias in Syria began to spill over into Turkey shortly after our arrival in late 2014. And uh, here's a brief context. As the conflict in Syria emerged, Kurdish groups constituted one of the most active groups fighting against the Assad dictatorship. And currently, as you might know, the largest political group in the Kurdish region of Syria is the Democratic Union Party. And the Rojava Autonomous Region of self rule is the de facto autonomous region originating in and consisting of three self-governing cantons. So the region declared its autonomy in November 2013 as part of the ongoing Rojava conflict, establishing a society based uh, on principles of direct democracy, gender e equality, and sustainability. So these three cantons are working in cooperation with many local and inter international players to push back the Islamic State. And as a result, the city of Mardin acquired strategic uh, significance in Turkish state Syria policies while also serving as the major center of Kurdish activism and organizing. 
So in the lead up to the collapse of the peace process and development in Syria in late 2014, government arrested 70 people affiliated with the Arctic group. And shortly after those arrests, Ahmed Aracha, a theological professor who had not supported Artuku's program, uh, initial original program, was selected to serve as the new rector of the university. So, in such a context, unfortunate context, we moved to Martin and immediately began to face an increasing degree of political pressure, discrimination, and censorship. In the face of such pressure, we immediately took part in the mobilization among faculty. We formed an initiative called Independent University Platform. So we attempted to reclaim our university and did so to a certain degree. Uh, we were successful to a certain degree to create a kind of counter hegemony on campus. Um, it was a loose group of faculty that strived to form a counter stance against discrimination, favoritism, undemocratic practices uh, on campus, and many more uh, we sensed would come which eventually did come. Uh, and uh, we took an active stance that the pro-government rector fired or suspended scholars on political ground. He unlawfully terminated 14 foreign faculty members in the summer of 2015, alleging that they were foreign intelligence agents or spies. Um, uh, the collapse of the Kurdish peace process and the adoption of a military strategy by the government following the June 2015 elections heightened tensions in the city of Mardin. Uh, Uli gave you a nice timeline, actually. I'm not going to go into detail, but I would briefly talk about uh, how we felt, how we experienced all these uh, terrible violent attacks against civilians in uh, Mardin, and then how we ended up in signing the petition. Uh, so even, uh, you know, by surpassing the 10% uh, threshold needed to enter parliament, uh, the uh, pro-Kurdish HDP has secured 80 seats. Uh, but even before the election day, there was ISIS threat against the Kurdish political groups and population. Uh, two days before the elections, there was a bomb attack in the electoral rally of the uh, HDP. Again, all the evidence directed at an ISIS member of Turkish nationality. After the election, which was a victory for the Kurds and Democrats and secular pe people of Turkey, there had been multiple bomb attacks. A spate of murders in eastern Turkey that began when 32 left-wing students activists died in a bomb blast at Suruç on their way to Kobane on uh, July 20th. And all these attacks targeted the democratic, secular, mostly Kurdish groups in the country and later spread to urban central areas in capital Ankara and Istanbul. Also, civilian representatives of the Kurdish politics were targeted. The president of the Diyarbakir uh, Bar, Tahir Erci, was killed in daylight. He was actually the symbol of peaceful civilian Kurdish politics. And in line with these attacks, Turkish army organized military operations in the Kurdish areas. All of a sudden, the region caught in a spiral of violence. And not only that, but also the state took drastic measures towards silencing the dissident media, including the uh, uh, Kurdish media. And in the middle of the escalating armed conflicts and state violence, we strive to teach about peace, equality, democracy, and freedom in our classes. However, any conversation about the current state curfew and heavy military operations is faced with reactions. We were not in a position to express our views freely in this town and in this university. For instance, I even detected a student reporting my lectures. According to some other sympathetic students, some of their peers were instructed by administrators to report on academics. And we had great uh, suspicions that uh, our phone conversations were tapped. Uh, we, on top of all these, uh, all these things, then we, alongside thousands of academics and researchers, have signed the open petition calling on state to end state violence and prepare negotiation conditions of, uh, for a peaceful solution. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I and my wife were reported to local officials for our dissident uh, views, and as a result, were subjected to surveillance by the anti terror police. Um, during government's campaign to intimidation against peace petition signatories, uh, beginning in January of this year, we had to leave Mar. 
we face such a degree of official harassment uh, at the university and uh, private threats that, that we presented uh, our resignation and eventually uh, were forced into exile in June 2016. As International Institute of Education, uh, Education Scholar Rescue Fund Fellows, uh, we are now hosted by uh, universities, Cornell University and Binghamton University. So, um, to conclude, uh, what I would like to underline once again is that the Kurdish issue, lie, issue lies at the heart of Turkish state's attacks against the Caliphate. In the Middle East, Kurdish movement in Turkey and Syria represents a strong, secular, democratic alternative to various jihadist and Islamist movements of the region. Therefore, um, any solidarity with the Kurds, any call for peace from the uh, west to end uh, regions, uh, eastern and uh, west to end state violence against Kurds, any bridges between the west and the east in Turkey is a reason for Turkish state to feel threatened. That is why academia in Turkey played its historic role by standing for peace and democracy against the Turkish state which represents nothing but authoritarianism, oppressive Islamism, gender oppression, anti-Semitism, anti-secularism, destructive capitalism, and religious fundamentalism. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me. Oh, I cannot hear you right away. <laughs> I think she might not be able to hear you. Yes. You need to turn on the mic. No. Just one of them. Okay. Yeah. No. Thank you very much, Azad. Thank you. Yeah, this is now we are listening to you. I'll turn on our mic. Thank okay. you. Uh, hi, everyone. Greetings from Germany. Uh, as Tunal mentioned before, I was a PhD candidate at the uh, University of Istanbul at the uh, Political Science Faculty and the Department. Uh, even though more than half of my faculty members signed the same petition with me, we were only a few students uh, in the whole university who signed the petition as students. Um, so I was, um, I was forced to quit my thesis by my supervisor. And I was told either I have to change my topic or I have to find a new department for myself. So, and um, the thing is, I was working on state violence against Kurds in Turkey. So, the topic was already really political, and um, she didn't want me to continue my research anymore. And uh, in my last semester at the university and my thesis, I was um, forced to quit. And um, afterwards, I have to apply for a new program and I found this program in Germany in, uh, at the University of Tübingen and now I'm doing my second master's here for a while. And um, apart from that, also my partner who was doing this internship at the same time and um, he's a German citizen and uh, he needed to prolong his internship due to some residency permit issues. And um, his mentor, uh, who was also at that time the head of the department, she refused to sign uh, his prolonging because of my political affiliation. So I think it's one of the like, really few cases when the gender relations work in the other way. <laughs> so he couldn't get his prolonging uh, because I signed the petition. And, um, but like in every story, this story also um, has another side. Uh, my colleagues uh, put it in the context of the human rights violations in um, Kurdistan, state violence, and the, um, the struggles that the academics for peace have been going through. And uh, from here, I would like to continue with the um, resistance and the solidarity, um, solidarity acts among the group uh, in academics for peace. So, um, uh, when we signed the petition, uh, of course, um, the, and after we have been targeted by the president, we started having some meetings, we talked about the situation, and um, we talked about what could we do from now on. So, we basically organized some commissions, some committees among the group, um, which are, uh, like one of them was the international group for networking, 
Uli is uh, also a member of that commission, and um, there was a commission of law. Basically, um, those were those are the academics with the law background or teaching at the um, law faculties and so on. And then there is the solidarity group, uh, which I'm also a member of this group. Basically, we are um, reporting, giving consultations, and documenting all the. Um, all the violations against the academics. I'm not sure um, if you've seen those reports already, because my um, connection is really bad, so I, I can't um, watch the thing from YouTube. So I'm not sure if you've seen those reports. So basically, we are preparing those kind of uh, materials. And we had, uh, we had some few groups. Uh, one of them was the project group. Since we are academics, of course, uh, we also need to keep on working uh, for our own research. So we decided to um, write some projects and uh, keep keep doing what we what we were doing before. And uh, the last one is the alternative academia, because um, since, as uh, Tuna mentioned at the beginning, our universities basically um, have nothing. So. I'm not even sure if we can call them universities anymore in Turkey. Uh, therefore, we decided to um, give some like common lectures and like so in like solidarity academias. The first one among this group was the solidarity lectures, uh, and which was followed by a social science congress in Karadun, Izmir. Uh, me and some of uh, our other colleagues. Uh, we basically prepared a common lecture for this conference uh, instead of just presenting our own papers. Uh, we had to work uh, on this a bit more, uh, and uh, since we don't live in the same city or not even in the same country anymore, uh, it took a while, but um, if I can manage to share my screen with you, I can show you some pictures of that conference. So. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, no. So, um, this is one of the days that they have been working, they were working on, the, uh, on this conference, the common lecture, and uh, again I was... Con I'm here. You're back? Yeah, yeah. So I have no idea where we stop. Do you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, Are but you? I don't know when we lost the connection. You just started showing us the photograph, the first photograph. Oh, okay. The first one? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so, you're big Uh, as I said, this is the, uh, one of the um, days that they worked on this that they worked on this conference and the presentation. And uh, this is another picture from the. Mm. Mm. They prefer not to use the pictures because mm. yeah, the pictures are yeah. too heavy. Let me write them. Academia for Society, or TAKA in short. And there's another uh, 
um, Solidarity Academy from Kojeli. Uh, those colleagues from uh, Kojeli University, they basically lost their jobs after the decree law, declar the declaration of the decree law in Turkey on 1st of September. And um, they didn't even um, allow to be at the campus. They couldn't even, uh, at the beginning, they couldn't even um, take their personal belongings from the university and afterwards they had to go to their own rooms uh, with the police officers of the university and the security guards. So, and those colleagues from Kojeli, now they have their own academia and uh, they are giving free uh, lectures in some solidarity places, like in some cafeteria or at the, um, at the conference hall of the, um, their labor union. And um, another series called Wednesday Seminars from uh, uh, Mimar Sinan University in Istanbul. Actually, this seminar series um, has been going on for the, like, if I'm not wrong, last 14 years. But this year, they decided to open those lectures and seminars um, of our colleagues who signed the petition or who, who already lost their jobs. So, um, since, if I'm not wrong, since February, all those Wednesday seminars um, are given by our colleagues. And another um, example from Eskişehir. Uh, Eskişehir is also a well-known case, I would say, because um, the University of Anadolu, Anadolu University and the Osman Gazi University, um, they, um, they basically charge investigations, administrative and disciplinary disciplinary uh, investigations against their um, members. So they have um, those seminars and the lectures. Uh, if I'm not wrong, and um, they are very crowded and people and the students in Eskişehir are very, very like those seminars. And um, I would like to mention another um, initiative, I guess, I can call initiative, which is academics something like Academics Without Borders. We are not sure about them yet, but probably it will be something like Academics Without Campuses, since uh, we are not even allowed to go, to go back to our universities. So, um, among, uh, apart from this one, uh, maybe I, I can also mention about uh, um, other types of solidarity among the group. Uh, one of them is financial support, since uh, many of our colleagues have already lost their jobs, of course, um, of course, they have to carry on with their lives, and um, they have to take care of themselves and their families. So, um, uh, through the labor union or some other um, foundations, we are basically collecting money for our colleagues, and uh, we are trying to support each other. And uh, maybe one last thing that I can mention right now, uh, which is the international um, solidarity among our colleagues who also signed like um, supporting letters, uh, or uh, like the colleagues you there and um, all around the world. So um, they are inviting us to their lectures, they invite us for conferences, or um, they invite our colleagues, but of course because of the travel bans, many of them couldn't even make it to those countries to present their works or giving speeches. It so we are uh, basically connecting through Skype, yeah. like we are doing right now. Okay, not yet. And um, yeah, I think so far I can just um, summarize what we are doing just like this. And if you have any further questions, I would like to um, answer. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to to talk here to make some some comments. Uh, I have no special qualification to be here. The only thing I can claim is that I try to think, but this is obviously no special qualification. On the contrary, it is what makes me just one among you. Now, well, in view of these reports and reflections, 
I, I ask myself, what can one say which is not simply or not only a feeling of rejection of such persecution of academics and other people and an expression of solidarity? What can one do? What should one do? For knowledge is not enough. Knowing the dreadful things happening in Turkey and elsewhere is not enough. We often witness unspeakable injustices and not far away. There where we live, there where we work, here where we are, and nothing at all happens. Nothing at all. So if knowledge does not spur us to what we ought to do, well, perhaps thought will. That's our only power, our only power, and if so, our only hope. I would therefore like to continue what our colleagues have started. Colleagues, it sounds so weak. Let me say I mean our friends, our comrades. What our friends have started by offering to you and to them three reflections and some questions that arise thereof. The first reflection bears on the relationship between the university and the powers in place. But this relation is part of a wider relation, which is that between the intellectual strata and the powerful, the rulers. The latter bond has a long story, much older than the university itself. And what can we say in a nutshell about that relationship between rulers and intellectuals? We can say that it has been and is largely a symbiotic relation. That intellectuals have as a rule always sought the benefits of the powerful by defending and obeying them in open or subtle but perhaps more effective ways. That's why Machiavelli famously and rightly claimed that he wanted to defend a thing that, quote, has been accused by all writers, by all the writers. He wanted to defend a thing that has been accused by all the writers, all the intellectuals. And this Machiavelli said at the end of the 14th century, beginning of the 15th century, and he was empirically right in saying that. And that thing was obviously the people, the people, the thing that Machiavelli wanted to defend. But what is the people doing in this story? Well, everything, because what all other writers before Machiavelli did was to accuse the people and to defend the oligarchy. And the beginning of the university, with the University of Bologna at the start of the 12th century, was, as is well known, a concession by the emperor to the law scholars who defended him in the dispute with the pope. Since then, and it's set in very rare moments and despite the enlightenment, the university has been in this situation of political dependence and subservience. That is to say, the university has been the utter antithesis of the reader's idea of the university without condition. The second reflection bears precisely on oligarchic power. Oligarchic power features among the oldest forms of domination in human history. Not only that, but, and this makes it unique, it has persisted across the most varied political regimes historical periods and kinds of societies, from ancient despotism and the land of despotism, according to our ideology developed by the Greeks, was Turkey, was Anatolia, was... It has persisted across the most varied political regimes, historical periods and kinds of societies, from ancient despotism to classical democracy, from medieval to modern times, from ancient slavery, slavery to contemporary imperial capitalism, impervious to most political and historical transformations. It is a massive and fearsome power, 
which people systematically underestimate. But of course, you will think, we live in a democracy. Do we? Really? In addition, you might think, oligarchies are not homogeneous groups, but internally divided, in conflict, and so on. And you might even mention the Gulenist in market Islam, Turkey, as evident, the Gulenists who are persecuted today in Turkey. This is certainly true. Oligarchies are neither fixed nor unified groups. Indeed, they grow ever slimmer. And it is these dynamics what really matters. These dynamics, today global in nature, whereby the oligarchy top becomes ever slimmer, more concentrated and rentier-like, whilst the mass base grows ever wider and more destitute and dispersed. This is what really matters. What is the position and structural function of intellectuals here, of intellectuals and therefore of academia, of the university? Many oppose these developments, you might say, and this is true. But one should not forget that the overwhelming majority de facto go along with these developments, and by so doing, they constitute a major structural support of such developments. Indeed, current oligarchic, the current oligarchic regime is supported by what is technically known as wealth defense industry, a huge industry involving journalists and the media, lawyers and, of course, the judiciary, the law and order system, and coercive apparatuses of all kinds. In this connection, I would like to ask you, what is the structural position and function of academia and academics in such an industry of wealth defense today in the UK as we are here? My third and final reflection bears precisely on the conditions that make it possible this process of growing intensity, a process beginning with fear, we are in it, and continuing with almost complete withdrawal into private life, total dispersion of the groups, total dispersion of academics, emancipatory compliance, accusations by students against teachers, by teachers against, by everybody against everybody else, because the managerial regime in which we are is about setting everybody against everybody else. You know this very well because you are social scientists and of course you analyze the society in which you live. And finally, growing violence and persecution. That is, all the dreadful things that had been and were so crucial in the unspeakable 20th century disasters. The distance between blind, fearful obedience in which we are, and those dreadful things, is it as big as you might tend to think? Really? What makes all this possible? We need to think, think, not just in the imaginary, but in the real. Thank you. questions now and we can take our reflections uh, to the working group this afternoon and then we'll, we'll, we'll break out. Uh, so the problem is um, because of the live stream we do have to use microphones for the sound to go out so no questions without mics. <laughs> Any immediate reactions? Yes. Thank you. My name is Andrew Neal, the University of Edinburgh. Um, last year I was involved in organising a section in a European International Studies conference which was going to be held in Izmir in, in Turkey. And eventually it was cancelled because of the attempted coup. But in the run-up to the cancellation there was much debate amongst the members of the organisation about 
what we should do about this conference. So it had been arranged several years before, um, I guess with not much uh, foresight of the political situation. And many of the people on the section I was organising, many Europeans and Americans were, uh, were pulling out, saying they didn't want to go to Turkey, they wanted to boycott Turkey or boycott the, the, the regime and so on. Whereas on the other hand, many of the people on our section were, were Turkish scholars and we were providing a platform to them for them to come and speak about these very issues. So we never, um, until the cancellation happened, we never really resolved what the right thing to do was, whether to boycott completely or whether to go to Turkey and stand with our, our Turkish colleagues. So I'd like to ask you what, what your view is on that dilemma. Um, is it on? Yeah, I think it's still on. Actually, I, uh, maybe Tibison would also uh, like to say something about this. Can she hear us? I'm not sure. I suppose she can. Um, but yeah, this is a discussion that we um, had so many times in all our meetings that we had uh, for, uh, I'll use the uh, Turkish abbreviation, BAK, so uh, the Academics for Peace. In our meetings, we, uh, yeah, we had this dis discussion uh, up and down quite a lot because precisely on the one hand, uh, we do want to sort of name and shame or we do want to sort of point out that these universities are doing wrong and sort of but our intention was always not to just say you know like especially with the sort of no kind of orientalism behind it with a European voice saying you shouldn't do that we didn't want that um, but and, and our focus was to sort of like maybe get our, our uh, colleagues and friends uh, back into their positions. So at the beginning, our position was very much more not, uh, more to encourage to yeah to buy by abide by some kind of academic standards and, and, and that critical academia and academic freedom should be possible. And this is includes a political expression of political stances. So at the beginning, our position was very much more to sort of encourage the re-employment of our, our co colleagues. But till, the, till now, we still haven't got a unified position. As we always emphasize, the, um, the Academics for Peace is a network of academics. It's no organization. There's no head. So um, if I'm speaking or Tebesum or, or Tuna, we somehow speak for ourselves and always for the network in the same way. So we ha never had a unified position on this. I think you, what your discussion was exactly reflects what we were discussing as well. Yes, we have to point out, and that's why we're here, um, point out and speak about the situation, point to these um, repressions. But on the other hand, um, we have to open up the way to sort of give um, uh, give a forum, give uh, give some kind of space for the academics, precisely as your 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 intention was. Well, yeah. May I go, Tebesum, and then you can, if you want. No, of course. Well, I can only give a personal answer, and uh, you know, now that you asked the question, I sort of thought about it, and I think, for example, another uh, IPSA conference was cancelled. That was to be held in uh, International Political Science Association. That was to be held in Istanbul uh, last year not because of uh, the uh, Academic for Peace uh, initiative or anything, but because of security concerns. But when these things are cancelled, either by choice or by security concerns, I think it sort of empowers the government's line. And this government is uh, very sort of skillful in turning everything uh, into a narrative of, look, the whole world is trying to screw us. And it really resonates with the public, who is already sort of more than ready, I mean the general public I'm talking about, who's more than ready to sort of buy into this argument that the whole world is a conspiracy against Turks and Turkey. So when, for example, a conference or a panel like yours decides to pull out of Turkey, it just defies the purpose in my opinion. But that's only my personal opinion. I mean, I see the point. I see that, you know, it's a sort of position to sort of raise concerns and shame and so on and so forth. But it doesn't work that way. The larger consequence in Turkey uh, among, uh, you know, the government officials and their relationship with the general public uh, who is following the government's official line, it is a statement of, look, they don't like us. They are just, you know, trying to sabotage Turkey and Turkey's position on whatever they are talking about. And then it just, you know, sort of is one more point that the government scores, in my opinion. So if you were to ask me, I would say, don't pull out, continue, 
and give uh, the Turkish scholars the platform and just, you know, it's just another voice platform. Yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. Um, I completely agree what you both said. Maybe? I can't hear you. Just take your headphones off if you want, because out. Um, sorry, I completely agree what you said uh, just now, and um, I would like to add like only a sentence maybe. Um, when you pull out those conferences or panels or whatever it is, it's also. Uh, it's also I know with the isolation isolation of the academics for peace. Since many of our colleagues and friends they have travel bans, they cannot go out, they cannot participate in those conferences. So um, yeah, sometimes we have the um, we have the opportunity to connect to Skype, which is not ideal actually. But uh, when we have those those kind of events, organization panels, conferences in Turkey, then we have the chance to be there. We have to talk about those things all together. And I think um, it's really important when we consider what we just said, so we can have like a unified, um, I don't know, like a unified solidarity action. So this is actually really, really important. Just today, one of um, my one of my friends, a colleague of ours also, uh, she, uh, he, lost her, he lost his job after the declaration of the decree law. He was supposed to come to Germany to the same university that I'm in right now, and um, he's taken up into the police custody at the airport. So now his, his passport will be cancelled, and um, he already lost his job, as I said. So it's the only option for him, for example, to attend those kind of events inside of the country. So. Azat, do you have anything to add? Uh, Tuna, Tuna, Tuna is better to one answer and allow more people in the public to intervene, yeah. you know, okay. only one answer. Oh, okay. Thank you.